Manhattan Neighborhood Network, in partnership with the League of Women Voters of New York State and Gotham Gazette, presents Race to Represent, a MNN election initiative. Hello, I'm Ben Max, executive editor of Gotham Gazette. It's a state election year in New York, including for the statewide positions of governor, lieutenant governor, comptroller, and attorney general. Today, we are pleased to bring you a debate among all four candidates running for the Democratic nomination for New York State Attorney General. The Attorney General is the state's top lawyer and chief legal officer, tasked with defending the state in legal proceedings, upholding state laws, and protecting the rights of all New Yorkers. The Attorney General is often referred to as the people's lawyer. The Attorney General's vast office protects individuals, consumers, investors, tenants, workers, and others and investigates financial firms, nonprofit compliance, Medicaid fraud, and much more. Of late, there has been a lot of attention on the role of the New York Attorney General as it relates to pushing back against the Trump administration and federal laws and practices. Though like many other parts of the job, that work is dependent upon the views and legal interpretations of the Attorney General. The office has also been looked to of late to take a stronger role in rooting out corruption in New York state government, though its powers in that regard are also fairly limited. We'll discuss that and more during this debate. This year's race for Attorney General of New York is wide open thanks to the resignation of former Attorney General Eric Schneiderman. His replacement, Barbara Underwood, who is the state Solicitor General, is not seeking election to the office. The New York primary is on Thursday, September 13th. The winner of this primary will be the Democratic Party nominee in the general election facing competitors from several other parties. That vote is November 6th. So let's get to today's debate. The Democratic Attorney General candidates are seated by random drawing, and starting from my left, we have U.S. Representative Sean Patrick Maloney, Licia Eve, Public Advocate Letitia James, and Zephyr Teachout. So thank you all for being here, and we're going to start with you, Mr. Maloney. How do you describe the role of the Attorney General? How do you describe the office? What are its powers? Right. Well, first of all, thanks, Evan. Uh, thanks, for Ben, for having us today. Uh, look, this is the champion for regular New Yorkers. It, this is the people's lawyer. This is the one office that ought to be working for you. And right now, that means working against these threats from Donald Trump in Washington. That's how I see the office. Whether you're talking about reproductive freedom or the environment or immigrants' rights, whether you're talking about property taxes, whether you're talking about infrastructure projects, really everywhere you look, New York is in the bullseye of this crowd in Washington. So you need to hold Donald Trump accountable for his own conduct, but the administration needs to be pushed back because it's coming after New York. And I am the only candidate in this race with six years in Washington in that fight. And that's the experience I bring to it. Because right now, the Congress is not playing the role it should as the constitutional check on the president. But the attorneys general are. And that's how I'm going to use this office, to, to stand up to this president and stick up for New York. Thank you. Ms. Eve, how do you describe the role of the attorney general and the powers of the office? Well, we're in unprecedented times. Uh, the office of the New York State Attorney General is more important than it has ever been in my 54 years. Uh, priority number one needs to be fighting against Donald Trump and the assault on our values and the rights, uh, all that we as New Yorkers hold dear, immigrant rights, reproductive rights, women's rights, environmental rights, LGBTQ rights. Uh, fighting against the rollback of criminal justice reform that took place under the Obama administration. So we have a lot to deal with in terms of fighting against uh, the horrific policies of this administration, as well as doing all that we can, all that I can as the next attorney general to hold the president of the United States personally accountable. But we have a lot of issues and a lot of challenges right here at home that New York State owns, advancing criminal justice reform, advancing voting rights, advancing environmental rights, uh, doing all we can to provide increased educational and economic opportunities for all New York children and families. So at the end of the day, it's the job of the Attorney General of our great state to do all that she can to make the state more fair and more just. At the end of the day, that is the job of the Chief Legal Officer and the People's Lawyer, and I am the most qualified, most prepared, most experienced candidate best to serve that role and would be proud to have the support of New Yorkers across the state to do just that. Thank you. Ms. James, how do you describe the role of Attorney General? We're at a pivotal point in history. We're careening towards a constitutional crisis. Um, we're in the midst of uh, our rights are being violated as a state and across this nation. We're at a very low point in our country. 
and we've been more divided now than we've ever been since the Civil War. And what we need now more than ever is an attorney general of the state of New York who will continue to speak truth to power, who will, power, who will continue to challenge the forces that be, who will stand up for marginalized uh, communities all throughout the state of New York, and individuals who unfortunately find their rights under attack, who are hiding right now as a result of uh, the abuses from the Washington, D.C., from Washington, D.C. This president right now, uh, unfortunately, has, uh, has uh, trampled on the rights of countless number of individuals throughout the state of New York. And what we need is someone who has a history and a record of getting things done and speaking truth to power. And so it's important uh, that we have someone uh, such as myself, who is a former public defender, a former city council member, a former assistant attorney general, a former uh, council and state legislature, and a public advocate of the city of New York who has gotten more done than anyone um, who is on this stage at this point in time. And that's what we need. This reminds me of the civil rights movement. And I'm the only one who went to a school which uh, basically uh, showed a mirror on this country and basically challenged the laws. I stand before you in the spirit of Barbara Jordan, who once served in the Congress and who was responsible, obviously, for bringing up impeachment, uh, impeachment uh, proceedings against Richard Nixon. We're in that moment again. And what we need is someone who stands in that spirit, and that's Letitia James. Thank you. And Ms. Teachout, how do you describe the role of the Attorney General of the state of New York? Yeah, I mean, I think we're really in a real wartime for our democracy right now, and there is no more important legal office in the country than the New York State Attorney General's office. Um, I have four priorities for the office, um, and the office, the, the job of the office changes with the context of the time and changes with the threats of the time. So the first priority is really being the firewall against the, um, the Trump administration, Donald Trump um, himself, uh, somebody who doesn't believe in the rule of law, uh, an open bigot, an open racist, somebody who is violating the Constitution. And against Donald Trump and the administration, it's important that we both uh, protect against the administration's illegal acts and use the unique powers of the New York State Attorney General to investigate his businesses and the illegal activity that we know he's involved in, violating the Emoluments Clause, and that he may be involved in in his businesses. The second priority, and again, this is the context changes the job, um, is really cleaning up Albany. Uh, we have a real corruption crisis and investigating corruption in Albany being a real check on a, a corruption crisis that is hurting New Yorkers. Um, state money is going to big donors instead of desperately needed economic development. The third priority um, involves, again, what's happening at the federal level and the unique job of the Attorney General moment in this time. We can't trust the EPA to protect our air and water. We can't trust uh, Jeff Sessions to protect civil rights. So instead, the New York State Attorney General needs to be the regulator of last resort, stepping up to protect um, basic, uh, our, our basic rights across the board. And my fourth priority is to use the platform to address the ongoing crisis of mass incarceration. Um, that means being a leading advocate for ending cash bail, discovery reform, a whole series of, of issues that are um, leading to the crisis, but also really trying to work to change the culture. Uh, we should have half the number of people that we have in prisons and jails right now. Thank you. So we're going to start this round with you, Miss E. We're going to alternate who, who gets asked first. Um, so tell voters, and we're heading towards, of course, the Democratic primary that you're all uh, running in for September 13th. Tell voters about yourself and your resume, and specifically, of course, how your experience to this point matches that description that you gave for the role of the Attorney General. Well, first of all, my roots in this state run deep. They run deep. Uh, born and reared in the great city of Buffalo, Western New York, proudly have called Harlem my home for the past seven years. My father was born here in Harlem uh, 85 years ago. And I have spent my life, my life, uh, championing social justice, fighting in the trenches for social justice, uh, served as a clerk to the first African American to serve a, a full term on the state's highest court. So right out of the gate, after I graduated from Harvard Law School, having conversations with judges, judges in this state about the most fundamental legal issues of our time, the case that I'm most proud of, and I've got more courtroom experience in New York State across the state than any other candidate, but the case that I'm most proud of is a case where I've represented hundreds of women incarcerated in District of Columbia prisons against the District of Columbia. I took on the D.C. prison system because of prison conditions that hundreds of women were living in. One of my clients had a leg shackled to a hospital bed as she brought a child into this world. Uh, it was a tough battle. 
uh, fighting the D.C. prison system, but we fought, we won. That's the kind of lawyer I was when I was barely 30 years old, and that's the kind of attorney general I will be for the people of the state of New York. Thank you, Ms. James. You mentioned some of the, the roles and offices, but uh, speak a little bit more to your experience and how it fits the role. So the Office of Attorney General, 70% of what the Attorney General does is primarily defensive work. It's state work. You, you're the uh, a, a attorney for all state agencies throughout the state of New York. It's not sexy. doesn't get a lot of attention. Then there's the affirmative litigation. Then there's the advocacy. And then there's an, the enforcement. That is the role, the constitutional role of the Office of Attorney General. As a former city council member who's passed laws, who's represented her com community, who stood, stood at the vanguard against uh, developers who would want to destroy the character of our community, um, I took the case all the way to the United States Supreme Court. I challenged E Empire State Development Corporation, basically challenging it and arguing that it abused eminent domain. Um, and we took that case all the way to the United States Supreme Court. I stood up against Mayor Bloomberg when he extended their term because it was uh, in violation of the Constitution. Um, and as a city council, I stood up and uh, passed uh, environmental laws, recycling laws in the city of New York. As a public advocate of the city of New York, we've resolved over 32,000 constituent complaints. We've passed more. We've passed more laws than all previous public advocates combined. We've been very active with respect to litigation. We've sued the mayor. We've sued the governor. Um, and we'll continue to stand up and initiate litigation. And we were the first uh, to file um, to be an amicus brief on behalf, of, on behalf of the Muslim ban against Donald Trump, on behalf of some activists who are seeking to be deported, on behalf of the LGBT community, um, the transgender community. Um, and we have been very active in the progressive space. And we'll continue to do that, speaking truth to power. And that's what we need now more than ever is a progressive attorney general. Thank you, Ms. Teachout. Your experience. Mm -hmm. um, we right now have a constitutional and corruption crisis at the federal level and in New York State. And I have spent my life as an anti-corruption expert uh, fighting against corruption. 72 hours after Donald Trump took office, um, I, I sued him in the Southern District of New York um, for violating the emoluments clause of the Constitution. I have been leading a legal strategy to force him to divest his business interests. And actually, that legal strategy is winning right now. My background as an anti-corruption expert is really painfully relevant right now. Um, it's what we need to take on Donald Trump. Uh, we are going to need to not only respond to the illegalities we know about, but complex and evolving issues that are going to arise because we are in a totally new territory right now with the Trump administration. Uh, my deep expertise really matters there. I also um, bring a lot of independence to the job. I am the only candidate um, who isn't taking corporate PAC money or LLC money. And I think that's really important. Um, uh, my campaign is funded by uh, over 17,000 contributions, the average of which is under $200. Um, and I, I can bring that independence to the job, which is key. I started my legal career as a death penalty lawyer, um, representing the people who are most hated in society. And the skills that I learned there, being creative, digging under every rock, building new legal theories, I'm going to bring to this job. Thank you. And Mr. Maloney, your experience and how it prepares you for this role. Well, thank you. I have 25 years of public and private sector experience. When I got out of school, I did a year volunteering with the Jesuits in, in Peru, in South America. Uh, when I came back, I spent 10 years off and on practicing law in, in this city. I ran complex investigations, uh, negotiated major transactions. I did a lot of pro bono work for tenants and for immigrants. Uh, I worked on special counsel investigations, congressional investigations, very relevant experience now. I worked with the senior staff of two governors. I oversaw at one time or another 13, 14 state agencies and departments, tens of thousands of employees, uh, tens of billions of dollars of budget authority. I worked for three years on the White House senior staff. I was the White House staff secretary. I saw every document that went to the President of the United States, worked directly with him, including all the code word and top secret national security information, uh, which is very relevant to the Russia investigation right now. And I've spent six years in Congress. I beat a Republican incumbent. I beat the Republicans twice after that. I'm the first openly gay member of Congress in the history of the state of New York. And I don't represent Chelsea. I represent Orange County and Putnam County, Dutchess County, uh, Northern Westchester. And the fact is, those are tough races. But I've been beating the Republicans at the ballot box. I've beaten the Republicans on the floor of the House of Representatives, where I've passed 30 bills into law in my, in my five and a half years in Congress, making our trains safer, keeping oil barges off the Hudson River, helping farmers, helping veterans. 
uh, doing good things uh, wherever I could. And I'm running for this office because that combination of public and private sector experience is exactly what we need right now to stand in the fight against Donald Trump and protect New York, to go after these crooks in Albany, and to stand up to the guys uh, on Wall Street. Thank you. So I think we have a lot of agreement about pushing back on the federal government. No surprise for those following the race. And of course, the fact that you're running in a Democratic primary. So let's talk a little bit more about the role closer to home in New York. We're going to start with you, Ms. James, this round. The, the powers of the attorney general are vast. There's 1,700 employees or so. There's satellite bureaus around the state. How do you manage the office? What are the issues you would focus on closer to home? Uh, a few have been mentioned, whether it's real estate or financial firms. Uh, talk a little bit more about the specifics of the, of the office here in New York. So there's 1,800 employees, 650 assistant attorney generals. The budget is $262 million. As I crisscross the state of New York, I've been to Buffalo. And unfortunately, in Buffalo, they are having problems with lead. They have one of the, uh, the highest asthma rates in, in this state, if not this nation. I've been to Newburgh, uh, Newburgh, where they are filing a federal case uh, against this administration uh, for remediating their soil near their water. I've been to Brentwood on Long Island, where they are dumping in communities of color all throughout the, the state or throughout the county of uh, Brentwood, the town of Brentwood. Uh, I've been to Brooklyn, where there's a significant problem uh, with um, uh, children with asthma as well. And I've been to Albany, where eight black men have been murdered. Um, there are issues all throughout the state of New York. I've spoken to consumers, primarily immigrants uh, and low-income individuals, who unfortunately are being victimized by unscrupulous businesses. And that's a subject matter of the Office of Attorney General. And then last but not least, um, as the former, as the public advocate of the city of New York, we've turbocharged the worst landlord list. And there's a significant number of tenants, particularly in the, here in the borough of Manhattan, who are facing great displacement. So all of these issues and more uh, we need to focus on. We can uh, not just focus on one singular issue. We've got to focus on all of the issues that New Yorkers care about. And as someone who have cr crisscrossed this state, um, she, I am uniquely qualified and know about all of the issues and can use the powers and leverage the powers of the Office of Attorney General to get these individuals justice because that's all that I am and that's all that I've been um, in, uh, as part of my life in public services is focusing on justice and serving others. Thank you. Ms. Teachout. Yeah, I, first I want to say that I have been incredibly impressed with the work that uh, Barbara Underwood has done as our Attorney General. Um, and what I want to focus on in this answer is the areas that I would bring a particular focus to. Um, there's incredible talent at that office, um, and I'm incredibly excited to work with the great attorneys there. Um, one, uh, because of the crisis, both at the federal level but also in New York State, and I think this is important, I would want to beef up the public corruption unit and the criminal capacity within the office. Um, two, um, and, and investigating corruption in Albany is a really big deal. Um, it's not something that the New York State Attorney General has traditionally done, but because of the ongoing crisis, we can't trust the uh, existing watchdog groups. Got to take it on. Um, and then there's a few areas that I want to put a particular focus on. One is we have an incredible crisis in big pharma, um, both in terms of deceptive practices by big pharmaceutical companies and outrageous drug prices. Um, Underwood just brought a really innovative, uh, important lawsuit, I think last week, um, uh, against Purdue. That's the kind of lawsuit I wanna bring, and it's gonna take creative thinking, new kinds of litigation, because again, we can't trust the federal government. Um, second, taking on big fossil fuel companies, uh, making sure that we are at the leading edge of environmental litigation, not just continuing the Exxon lawsuit, but I have new ideas for new areas of litigation in the areas uh, in the environment. Three, Thank taking on uh, wrap it up, please. Go ahead. Last uh, one. Uh, taking on big real estate. Thank you, Mr. Maloney. Well, look, you know, this is the most important public interest law firm uh, in the state, maybe in the country. Uh, it's a big office, and, and I think I'm the only one on the stage that's actually managed large organizations, managed lots of employees, managed that much budget authority. It's very important that you know how to manage a big organization. And here are the priorities. The fact is, you got real threats in Washington, terrible corruption in Albany, and you've got a, you've got a core set of functions to protect consumers and citizens against business interests here in New York. You got to do it all. You got to walk and chew gum at the same time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to identify the key threats coming out of Washington. We see a lot of them. There's about 42 pages in a list on my desk of actions Barbara Underwood has taken. I think she's fantastic. I'd love her to stay on in any capacity she wants. The fact is, though, 
the, there are so many threats coming from D.C., whether you're talking about the environment, where we see threats to, to our initiatives against climate change, or our health care, uh, not just not just prescription drug companies that are out of control and overcharging consumers, but also the threats to the Affordable Care Act, the essential plan here in New York, to our Medicaid system. All of those have to be stood up to. Look at what's happening in immigration with the Dreamers, separating kids at the borders. A member of my team had her mom and dad deported. Her dad died during the process. As, as a congressman, I was able to get in that fight and, and give him more time with his family. But an attorney general can go into court and stop it. So this office is about using the tools available to you uh, uh, under the law to stand up to the uh, Trump administration, to root out corruption in Albany, and to stick up for consumers here in New York. And I'm the only one with the management experience to do it. Thank you. And Miss Eve, what areas would you focus on? Uh, what are some things that the Attorney General's office can do here in New York? Well, first of all, let me say I am by far the most prepared and most experienced candidate on this stage to deal with the myriad of challenges that we face. Uh, as counsel and Homeland Security Advisor for four and a half years to Hillary Rodham Clinton, I fought in the trenches with Hillary to advance reproductive rights, to advance women's rights, to advance civil rights, to advance voting rights, to fight against bad judges. And as the first woman and as the first person of color in the history of our state to be the chief economic development advisor to a governor, overseeing 11 agencies in state government, from Empire State Development to agriculture and markets, I am best prepared because my knowledge of this state is unmatched and my experience fighting for New Yorkers is unmatched. I think our challenges really fall into three buckets. One a relentless focus on fighting corruption. I am the daughter of two great public servants. I know what good, good public servants uh, look like and what they can do. And there's so much distrust in government right now, and fighting corruption will be a top priority because we need to restore that trust. We also need to make sure, you know, as I'm traveling across the state, and I haven't been traveling across the state just as a candidate. I've known this state for so many years. New Yorkers are still anxious about uh, being taken for a ride. And so I will be aggressively advocating to protect consumer rights. But at the end of the day, we must reform our criminal justice system, which is totally unfair to black and brown, particularly black and brown young men. If people don't have faith in their criminal justice system, little else matters. Thank you. So, uh, Ms. Eve got at this a little bit. Mr. Maloney talked about management and the size of the office and, and being So I, I just want to give uh, Ms. Ticha and then Ms. James a chance to, in 30 seconds, address your management experience and if you're prepared to run an office of this size or what makes you prepared, how you would do it. And then we'll start the next round of questioning with you, uh, Ms. Ticha. So just quickly on uh, the idea of running such a large office and are you prepared for that? Great. Um, look, I was the national director of the Sunlight Foundation, a large uh, uh, transparency organization, but I've worked with large teams of lawyers. I, as a death penalty lawyer, uh, we worked with large teams of lawyers on class action suits. Um, recently with the Trump litigation, I've been working with an incredible team of lawyers. I see the essence of the job as leading the state's legal strategy and dealing with the genuine crisis that we're facing. And my unique background as a true leader, um, I wrote the book on anti-corruption uh, law, um, is makes me uniquely qualified for this moment. Great, thank you. And Ms. James. I'm a public, former public defender. I've represented a countless number of individuals in the criminal justice system and, in fact, still do. Um, in addition to that, um, I've worked with legal services all throughout the state of New York and continue to have discussions with them now uh, about the challenges that are facing immigrants, about the issues of consumer fraud, um, about a myriad of issues all throughout the state of New York, and the number of legal services uh, right now are in the hundreds, if not thousands. And then lastly, um, I am a public advocate of the city of New York and right now have a staff of around 52 um, and have uh, transformed that office, um, made that office relevant, um, and have initiated litigation into the Office of Public Advocate, where we have filed more lawsuits than, any, than all previous public advocates combined and introduced more legislation, inclu including groundbreaking legislation to ban salary history because equal pay for equal work should be more than just a slogan. So we've got the management experience and we've got the experience to get things done Thank and we've got a proven record over 20 years. Thank you. So we're going to come around uh, to start a new round of questioning with you, Ms. T. Jott. Public corruption, corruption in Albany, and by that is shorthand for state government, of course, not just the, the, in the city of Albany uh, or the state capital there, but, but corruption throughout the state. And we've obviously seen recent examples with the Democratic state assembly leader, the Republican uh, state senate leader, 
in Governor Cuomo's administration and economic development programs. So let's talk about corruption in New York state government. Uh, Ms. TJ, you talked about this, but the, the powers of the state attorney general in rooting out public corruption are fairly limited. So how do you do that? What, what is it that you do as attorney general, and we're starting with you, to root out public corruption in New York? Okay. First of all, this is a real priority. It is a crying need. Um, I mean, the trial this summer, uh, the Buffalo Billion trial, showed that that $750 million of money that was supposed to go to economic development went to big donors instead of the people who most sorely needed it. So corruption is really holding us back as a state. It's hurting us. And um, when the Moreland Commission was shut down four years ago, I spoke out loudly against that. I actually had testified at the Moreland Commission. Um, but actually, uh, I don't know that all people realize this, that um, Andrew Cuomo shut the Moreland Commission down in a press call. Um, he never formally rescinded Executive Order 106. And laws are laws. You got to follow the, the correct pr procedure. So there are existing authorities within the New York State Attorney General's office to investigate corruption in Albany. And I will use those authorities. I will use them right now. I will use them the minute I take office. And so you think um, that executive order still holds? You don't need referrals to go after the type of public well, approval? I'm just beginning. OK. Well, <laughs> so, so, 10 more seconds. Right. Yeah. OK, so, so um, it hasn't been rescinded. Second. We need um, the governor to issue a new Moreland Commission to make totally clear that the work is not done. Third, we need a legislative referral. All of those are necessary. But the truth is, we haven't had an attorney general who's focused on this. With a strong public corruption unit, with a strong criminal unit, there are areas of jurisdiction. And the key thing you want to know is it's a focus. Okay. It's something that I care about. Thank you. I'm going to stop yeah. you there. Mr. Maloney? Right. Well, so that was a lot about the problem. Here's, I think, what you can do about it, even with an existing law. Although existing law should be changed to give the Attorney General primary criminal jurisdiction over public corruption, period, full stop. Shouldn't be any referrals or anything else. Y'all just go get it and prosecute it. We need to change the law. But under existing law, first, let's start with the Trump administration, because that's the most serious corruption problem we face. I want a senior official in my office coordinating on day one with Bob Mueller and the federal investigation to make sure that we are hand in glove love to demand accountability of this administration. That same official should coordinate with a controller, authority heads, and other entities that can refer public corruption cases if you never get one from the governor. But I also think it's important to have a working relationship with the governor to demand all the referrals that he can provide. In addition to that, you want to partner with your local DAs. You can provide assistant attorneys general staff to those DAs who have primary jurisdiction for corruption. And you can do other things, like look at the existing authorities under things like the Medicaid crime a Medicaid Control Fraud Act under federal law, which gives you extraordinary jurisdiction to go after uh, wrongdoing at Medicaid-funded entities. A lot of public dollars go in there, billions and billions. That's everything, by the way, from sexual violence and harassment in Medicaid-funded facilities to outright theft of public dollars. So there's a lot you can do under existing law, but you better start with Trump and you better ask for a change in the law in New York so that you can really get at this corruption and hit it with a sledgehammer. Thank you. Ms. Eve. I would aggressively advocate to expand the authority of the Attorney General to go after uh, corruption both in Washington and in New York State. But the existing law is potent, and I would use it to its fullest extent. Going after uh, the Trump administration and Donald Trump personally uh, for any violation of state law uh, that he may have committed. And that's the reason why this office is second only to Bob Mueller in terms of holding the President of the United States accountable. But there's significant authority, existing significant authority for the New York State Attorney General to go after corruption across our state, including in Albany, where it has uh, been too prevalent. In 2011, the state controller and the Attorney General of the State of New York entered into a memorandum that is incredibly powerful, incredibly impotent, incredibly potent. And the gist of what that document says is the state controller who has, responsible for, with, has responsibility with respect to all public funds will automatically have direct relationships with the state attorney general and will refer investigatory matters to the state attorney general's office. So anytime we're talking about the use of taxpayer funds, whether it is funds used to pay a legislator, whether it's funds to uh, fund different economic development programs, the authority, the existing authority, because of this uh, unprecedented relationship and agreement between the state controller and the attorney general, gives the current attorney general, will give me as the next attorney general, 
significant powers to root out corruption, and that's what exactly I'll do. Thank you, and Ms. James. I'm the only candidate who stands on this stage who's actually uh, focused on corruption. Um, as a city council member um, and chair of contracts, I uncovered the biggest scandals in the city of New York, known as City Time, where we recovered $700 million for taxpayers working with Juan Gonzalez from the Daily News. We will continue to do that by following the money. So one, the first 100 days in the, as the next attorney general of the state of New York, one, we will ask uh, the state legislature to provide us uh, with the ability to investigate um, corruption in Albany. Two, it's really critically important that we focus on all of the authorities that continue to exist throughout the state of New York. These public benefit corporations that need to be investigated that focus really on um, economic, alleged economic development in the state of New York, and that's what's critically important. We also need to close the LLC loophole. We need ethics reform. We need public uh, financing of campaigns in the state of New York. We need to focus on all of those things and more. But you need to know how government works, because the Moreland Commission has ended, but the reality is that corruption continues. And what we need is another Moreland Commission, but we need should not have to go to the governor of the state of New York. And that's what's really critically important. You should have the independent power to investigate corruption on your own, period, and end of story. A couple of follow-ups for everybody. We're going to keep these fairly brief, but um, uh, related to the governor, uh, we don't know, of course, you know, we're going to see the outcome of your election, we're going to see the outcome of the gubernatorial election, but um, assuming Governor Cuomo is still in office, for example, or even is out of office, a couple questions related to recent uh, allegations and revelations around the way he's run his office and things that he said. So. In a short answer, responses to two things, and starting with you, Mr. Maloney. One, the governor recently said in a New York Magazine interview that the trial of his former campaign manager and top aide, Joe Prococo, that it didn't touch the governor personally, was basically an exoneration of the governor. Do you agree with that? And secondly, there have been calls for an investigation into the governor for allowing Joe Prococo to seemingly do campaign work out of his executive office, there's calls for an investigation into that. Do you support that? So do you agree that the trial exonerated the governor? And do you support calls for an investigation into the governor letting Prococo use government offices, perhaps for campaign purposes? Look, I think any time there's corruption at that level of state government, the person at the top of state government should say, I'm the accountable person. The buck stops here uh, with me. Um, if there's no wrongdoing by the governor, then that's fine. Uh, th that'll come out, too. You shouldn't be afraid of the truth. You shouldn't be afraid of a full investigation. And that's what should happen. And I used to serve on, that, on the second floor. I, I worked in those offices. The fact is, is you know when you're there that you're, you have a public trust. And it's not good enough to say, you know, there's no evidence of wrongdoing. You've got you've to avoid the appearance of wrongdoing. And you have to be willing to let that process run its course. So yes, let the chips fall where they may. Throw the book at Joe Prococo. I don't have any patience for any of these guys. The truth is, is that we shouldn't be carrying water for anybody in public office who's stealing from the public. It's wrong, and if a regular man or woman did it in their workplace, they'd pay the consequences. Uh, powerful people should be no different. Okay, thank you. Ms. Eve? While there's no evidence that the governor engaged in wrongdoing, I, I agree with Sean that we need to hold ourselves to a higher standard. We need to hold ourselves to a higher standard. Uh, as the Attorney General, hopefully on January 1, if there's wrongdoing in my office, the buck stops with me. And with respect to your second question in terms of a potential investigation, uh, having worked for a governor for two and a half years, the rules are black and white. You are not to engage for in political. Cuomo, we should know. Yeah, yeah, you are not to engage in political activity in a government space. And so, yes, I would support uh, an investigation. Uh, and wherever that investigation leads, if it leads to prosecution, I will absolutely prosecute uh, for violations of civil or criminal law. Thank you, Ms. James. I entered into public service because I believe it's a noble profession, and I still believe it's. A a noble profession, serving others as opposed to serving yourself. We've got a problem with corruption in the state of New York. 30 elected officials on the state level have either been convicted and or uh, uh, penalized or uh, punished. And we become the laughing stock of the state of New York. We need reforms. Uh, we need a wide range of reforms, and it's really critically important that the governor of the state of New York removes the taint or the appearance of impropriety and, again, make sure and ensures that we are there, uh, again, to serve others, because we're the public confidence in 
in individuals who are in government is at an all-time low. And what we need to do is restore, restore confidence and integrity in public service. And that includes making sure that every public benefit corporation is transparent, that there's accountability, that there's checks and balances, and that we engage in our own, we engage in investigations to ensure that no one is engaging in political activity in government offices. And that is not only extends to, um, to, to Albany, but to Washington and into the city of New York. Listen, we're looking at Manafort right now, and if you look at his investigations right now, it's all about tax evasion and it's all about bank fraud. And it's really critically important that we understand that there's corruption um, in Washington and we need to get to the bottom of it, but obviously we need to hold our hell, ourselves to a higher principle, and that is public service. So just quickly, on the on the use of the government office for campaign purposes, yeah. it seems like there was a lot of evidence uh, entered into the, the Prococo trial that indicated that, but that wasn't a, a charge against him. Do you support an investigation into what happened there? So again, if there was, uh, if the individuals used a public office for political purposes, they should be prosecuted and um, prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And what we as Attorney General and I as the next Attorney General will do is follow the evidence and the facts wherever it leads. And if it leads to the second floor, so be it. It's important that individuals understand that no one is above the law and no one is below the law. Thank you. And Ms. Chow. Yeah, I mean, we, we clearly need a further investigation into state resources being used uh, for, a, uh, for a campaign. Uh, one thing that I want to point out that hasn't been pointed out is that there is an agency that is supposed to investigate corruption and sexual misconduct in Albany. Uh, it's called JCOPE. And the head of that agency, Seth Agata, uh, was Andrew Cuomo's former lawyer. Um, and according to the testimony at the Prococo trial, he was fully aware of Prococo using um, state resources for campaigns. This is a real problem when you have the head of an ethics agency themselves uh, potentially violating key ethics laws. Seth Agata must resign. Um, there are a whole, a whole bunch of other reasons, but uh, he has, has shown himself not to, in fact, be able to lead a watchdog group. And Jacob needs total reformation, to be clear. For, for the listeners, this, uh, the whole commission structure is it's appointed by insiders instead of truly independent. But we also need to hold Agata accountable. Um, and clearly, Andrew Cuomo has to take responsibility for the ongoing corruption scandals in Albany. OK, we're going to start uh, this round with you, Ms. Eve. There, there's, um I think uh, comments by Ms. James sparked some discussion about how much uh, the attorney general should really be looking at Wall Street, financial crimes. The Martin Act is obviously a major uh, factor in the attorney general's work. There's some efforts to undercut, to gut the Martin Act. There's a lot of conversation always about, obviously, the power of financial institutions. So how would you approach, as attorney general, how would you approach Wall Street, meaning financial institutions, banks, et cetera. And also, if you want to touch on, of course, real estate, because real estate money is obviously often uh, you know, part of uh, interacting with, with how those banks operate. Well, I would continue the efforts to, uh, to aggressively investigate Wall Street. I mean, Wall Street has the assets of New Yorkers. It has our retirement funds. Uh, the resources that we have worked so hard for as New Yorkers going to work day in and day out, we have to make sure uh, that New Yorkers are not t being taken for a ride. So I would continue the very aggressive efforts. You know, we've been asked, would we like the, the name Sheriff of Wall Street? I didn't hesitate. Absolutely, yes. I want to be known for making our criminal justice system more fair, but absolutely the Sheriff of Wall Street. And, and that's not to cast dispersions on our financial institutions. Most of them, each and every day, have millions of people who call New York State home, who go to work every day playing by the rules. But there are bad apples, and those bad apples need to be held to account. Uh, what I would types not... of practices, I'm sorry to interrupt, what types of practices uh, by financial institutions typically raise flags? Uh, well, misleading marketing practices. And that is where the Martin Act, in particular, uh, can be such a potent tool. Yes, it is 
is a relatively broad statute that's been around for many decades. There have been efforts to roll back and, and narrow the significance of the Martin Act. I would oppose any such efforts because the Martin Act is an incredibly potent tool to hold all kinds of businesses, including financial services companies, accountable. Ms. James, I, I referenced your comment. You say you didn't necessarily want to be known as the sheriff of Wall Street, but then you also uh, issued a statement after saying you, you want to focus on a variety of things, including Wall Street. So I just want to make that clear, but I'll give you a chance, obviously, sure. to talk about it. Listen, I um, live in Brooklyn. I know the foreclosure crisis. I've seen it up close. I've represented individuals who are being evicted. I've seen a countless number of individuals who've lost their homes. And not enough individuals on Wall Street, unfortunately, were put in jail and or, and or uh, punished as a result of that. And most of the individuals on Main Street lost their main asset. No, I don't want to be known as the sheriff on Wall Street. That's reserved for someone else. I want to, you know, chart my own path. I want my own title. And my own title has always been and will continue to be, to be fighter, and fighter for the underdog, fighter for individuals who, um, like those homeowners who lost their homes. Yes, the Martin Act is a powerful instrument. And the first 100 days as the next attorney general, what we really need to do is fix um, a, a decision um, which, were, which basically said that the Martin Act should be limited in their statute of limitations to three years. I believe it should be at six years, to, uh, should be extended to six years. And we will uh, make sure that that legislative uh, fix is corrected within the first hundred days. We will also ensure, and I've already begun discussions with the legislature with respect uh, to changing uh, that pardon loophole and making sure uh, that in the fact if President Trump were to pardon anyone, particularly Manafort, um, that in fact we could charge him under state crimes because all of most of the crimes that Manafort committed were committed in New York City. And we've got a responsibility and a duty as the next attorney general to go after those individuals and to enforce the Martin Act and to stand up for Main Street. Thank you. Ms. T. Chow. Well, you know I want to be called the sheriff of Wall Street, um, but, I, but I want to put this in a larger frame. The, the real reason that it is so important to have the attorney general's office uh, really put a focus on um, financial crimes and consumer protection is because of what is happening at the federal level. It's always been important, but when you have rollbacks at the federal level of key protections, when you have the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, something that I fought hard for, um, uh, be led by somebody who doesn't believe in consumer protection, it really becomes essential that the New York State Attorney General really be the regulator of last resort. Um, and that means putting real resources into investigation. One of the things I uh, you know, really take from Spitzer's use of the Martin Act is that was an example of an old tool that hadn't been used being dusted off and used in new and critical ways to hold um, Wall Street accountable. That's the kind of creative uh, uh, lawyering, creative legal strategy that I, as, as the next sheriff, will pursue. And here's something really important. I'll be able to pursue that with total independence because I'm the only candidate up here who isn't taking corporate money. I don't take corporate PAC money. I don't take LLC money. And I think it's particularly important when your job is regulating Wall Street not to be taking money from um, corporations. Thank you. And Mr. Maloney. Well, look, of course, you're going to be the sheriff of Wall Street. That's literally the job. But, uh, but of course, you also want to be the sheriff of Donald Trump. And you want to be the sheriff uh, demanding some accountability from the federal government when they're breaking the Constitution, breaking existing law. They aren't above the law. You have to be the sheriff calling them on that. That's what the AGs are doing right now. I want to be the sheriff of environmental protection because the Trump administration is trying to make our air dirtier, our water dirtier, rolling back our climate change efforts. That's what I did when I stood up and fought to keep anchorages and oil barges off the Hudson River in Congress. I want to do that work as attorney general. I want to be the sheriff of LGBT equality. You know, I had to wait 22 years to get married. Uh, I've been married for four. So for 26 years, my partner had been raising kids in a legal system that often said our family didn't count. I know what it's like to be discriminated against. I want to be the sheriff of criminal justice reform. I've written legislation in Congress with my friend Cory Booker to change the way we give lawyers to people so that the, the, the guarantee of effective counsel means something under the Sixth Amendment. That's what I've done in Congress. You want to do that in this office. You've got to be the sheriff of antitrust law. Zephyr talks about all laws. She's right. The Donnelly Act should be dusted off. We can step into the breach as the federal government steps back. And there's other things this office can do. But you better have the management experience to run it as well. You better have, have the experience running a large organization. 
And, uh, and that's what I bring to this, to, uh, to this conversation. All right, so we're going to shift it up a little bit here. We're going to do a lightning round of yes or no or short answers, uh, move that right along. And then we're going to move into our cross-examination round where you get to ask one of your opponents a question. So uh, a couple different formats coming up. So we're going to start the, uh, the lightning round here uh, with Ms. James. We're going to start with you the next, the next question. So there's about eight questions here coming. Short answers will move right along, OK? Uh, does Governor Cuomo deserve re-election? Yes. Ms. Yeah. Teachout. Mr. Malone. I believe so, yes. Ms. Yes. Eve. Yes. Uh, does Comptroller Tom DiNapoli deserve uh, re-election? We're going to start with Ms. Teachout. Yes. You bet. Yes. Yes. OK. Uh, do you believe in ending cash bail, Mr. Maloney? Absolutely, and I'd make it the top priority. Absolutely. Yes, I've spoken about it for years as a former criminal defense attorney. Absolutely, yes. Okay. And Ms. Eve, do you support the New York City plan to close Rikers Island? And just a little bit, what's the sort of general time frame? Do you support closing the Rikers Island jails? And, and do you have an estimate of the time frame it should take? Yes, absolutely. Recognizing the close of Rikers Island is hard, but I've got the experience to work with the city of New York and the state of New York that can play a supportive role in getting Rikers closed and getting it closed within, a, within uh, less than 10 years. I mean, it's not going to happen in two or three, but we need to not have this take a decade to get it done. Thank you, Ms. Jane. Yes. Uh, reform cash bail, decriminalize mental health, um, decriminalize poverty, um, and uh, make sure that we have open discovery and legalize marijuana. And we can do it in less than 10 years. Thank you, Ms. Teachout. <laughs> Look, I'm a former death penalty lawyer. I have seen up close what our mass incarceration system looks like. And I don't think people yet know. Uh, you want short? Sure, Sorry. yes, 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 I was <laughs> okay, about to say. Okay, so 10 years is way too long, and New York needs to lead the country in ending mass incarceration. Thank you, Mr. Maloney. Right, we built the Empire State Building in 13 months. I think you can do better than 10 years, and I support it. Okay, Ms. James, uh, have you released your taxes in the, the running of this race, and uh, what's been your approach to that? I have um, released my taxes for the last five years. I've urged all of my uh, uh, opponents to reach, release their tax returns. None have done so, and I'm even prepared to release my last 10 years of tax returns. Thank you, Ms. Teachout. I, this is an area where we totally agree. Um, absolutely, we'll be releasing my tax returns by the end of the week. By the end of the week, okay, Mr. Malone? Same. Same, how many years? Uh, five years. Five, five years? Five, five years. Was that five years, Ms. Eve? No, I have not, uh, but I have uh, had many years of detailed financial disclosures. Okay, and we we'll start with uh, Ms. Tija. Do you, if you're elected Attorney General, do you plan to run for governor someday, or will you totally rule that out? I totally rule it out. I want this job and only this job. Okay, Mr. Maloney? Yeah, I want this job. I'm not running for any other job. I want okay. to be the Attorney General of New York. Okay, Ms. Eve? I want to be the people's lawyer and only the people's lawyer. And so you're ruling out a governor run? Yes, I am. Okay, Ms. James? I'm ruling it out. I'm running for Attorney General. Okay. But you ran for governor before. <laughs> <laughs> Never again, I guess, is the pledge here. Uh, back to Mr. Maloney. Uh, are you licensed to practice law in New York? Is your paperwork uh, all up to date? Are you, a, are you a member of the bar? Yes, I am, uh, proudly, since 1993. And, uh, and I don't think anybody has more experience running complex investigations and uh, working in the legal community than I do. Okay, Ms. Eve? Yes, I'm uh, licensed to practice law. I've been a member of the bar for almost three decades, and yes, my paperwork is up to date. Okay, Ms. James? I'm a member of the bar since 1988, and passed more laws than all previous public advocates and all of the individuals who are on this stage, and okay. gotten more things done in this state and sitting. Ms. Teachout? I've, I've been a lawyer for 17 years, and I think by the time this, uh, I'm getting sworn in on Wednesday, so yes. I think by the time this airs. Okay, uh, and we'll start with Ms. Eve. Last couple here. Uh, there's a, a lot of calls, including, I, I believe, from Ms. Teachout, I'm not sure, maybe yourself, but for uh, open uh, hearings on sexual harassment in Albany, uh, sexual harassment in state government, but also the private sector. Uh, do you support calls for those hearings? There were obviously laws passed in the last budget without public hearings, and now there's sort of been increasing calls for some public hearings and perhaps tweaks to those laws. What's your stance on that? Absolutely, I support uh, public hearings, and let me say, as counsel to Joe Biden, it was my job more than two decades ago to help him implement the Violence Against Women Act. Absolutely, we ought to have hearings on Thank the you, issue. Thank you, Ms. James. As someone who led rallies out outside of Fox 5, um, and as someone who believes that the state legislature should pass the Crime Victims Act, particularly given the report in Pennsylvania, as the next attorney general, I will do a similar report, again, investigating the Catholic Church uh, for uh, allegations of abuse against children here in the state of New York, it's a sin, and it's really critically important that we stand up for victims of sexual harassment, as, as, as I have done over the last 20 years of my public service. So no hearings necessary at this point? 
Um, hearings, yes to hearings. Yes to hearings. Ms. Ticha. Yeah, I uh, stood with the sexual harassment working group victims and whistleblowers over a month ago now calling for hearings this summer. And I think it's really important we hold them right now. Okay, I'm going to so. stop you there. And Mr. Maloney. Yes to hearings and zero tolerance to sexual harassment and violence. Okay, thank you. To you, Ms. James, uh, do you support an ongoing fran uh, ban on fracking in New York? Yes. Ms. Teachout. Absolutely, yes. Mr. Maloney. Yes, I support it. Ms. Yes. E. Okay. Do you support closing, uh, completely closing the LLC loophole? We're starting with you, Ms. Teachout. Yep, and I'm closing it in my own campaign. I take okay. no LLC money. Mr. Maloney. Yes, we should close the LLC loophole and we should public fi uh, publicly finance campaigns. Okay, yeah. Ms. Eve. Yes, and I strongly support as well public financing of campaigns. Ms. James. Yes, definitely, without a doubt. Okay, and uh, finally, we'll start with Mr. Maloney. Uh, last lightning round question. If you weren't able to vote for yourself in this race, which of the other three candidates <laughs> would you vote for? I would vote for my friend, Lee Eve. I think she's a great, uh, a great person, great lawyer. I've known her and her family and respected her for 20 years. Thank you, Ms. Eve. That's a good question. Thank um, you. I hadn't really thought about that. Uh, well, I without question would support the, the winner of the Democratic primary. So if I am not the winner on September 13th, uh, I will support whomever is the winner of that race. Okay. Ms. James? I'm going to support the Democratic nominee, whoever that is, and it will be Letitia James. No one wants to take Mr. <laughs> Maloney up on actually making a choice. Okay. Ms. Teachout, will you? Yeah, I know I will. Um, uh, I, 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 I support uh, Alicia. I think Lisa and I both have a vision of the office, which is that it's a lawyer. It, the legal strategy is really at the heart of the office. And um, as attorney general, I believe that innovation in, in, uh, in the law is critical. Okay, one more chance? No. Okay, cross-examination. So uh, we're going to start with Miss Eve. You've uh, gotten a, a pseudo-endorsement from a couple of your competitors. So um, we'll, we'll start with you uh, and move this way. An opportunity to ask uh, a brief question, not a speech, uh, a brief question of one of your competitors. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Sean, um, for your uh, last comment. But I did want to ask you. So you've got a fellow member of Congress, Kathleen Rice, extraordinary woman, public servant, who almost beat Eric Schneiderman uh, eight years ago uh, when she was seeking to be the attorney general. And she made a statement publicly a couple months ago that even though she wanted to run, she felt legally she was prohibited from doing so. Why do you believe that you can run for re-election for Congress and for Attorney General at the same time when a fellow woman member of Congress made the exact opposite legal conclusion? Yeah, it's a great question, but of course the court has ruled that she was wrong. The uh, court has ruled that it's actually perfectly permissible, and this happens all the time. I mean, Tish is the, you know, the public advocate, and she's running for another office. Um, I, I don't think there's anything that unusual about it. And Kathleen's a great friend and a great, great member of Congress. Uh, but the court has actually already decided that she was just wrong about that. Just follow so, up quickly on that. Sure. Legality aside, do you think there's anything wrong with doing it in terms Honestly of? Honestly, not. And and the fact is, is that this is all about service, and it's all about where we can do the most good. And 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 as a member of Congress, I told you that story about a member of my my team losing their parents to deportation. I was able to slow it down. This office can stop it. I don't think Democrats are doing enough. I want to do more. And okay. and that's and why I'm running. Any, um, Flack from your constitu your congressional constituents about pursuing the a the AG role? No, listen. I love my constituents and I love the work that I do. I'm proud that I passed 30 bills into law. I'm proud that I beat Republicans three times in a row. I'm the only guy on the stage, by the way, who's ever beat Republicans at the ballot box. I think that matters for Democrats right now. I think we ought to start winning. And I think that the fact is, is that uh, this office provides me the opportunity, just like these other folks, to take my skills and to do more. And and I'm proud of that. I'll quickly say, even though it's a very heavily Democratic city, Miss James has, of course, won. Uh, against re Republican candidates, but uh, but general point taken. <laughs> uh, Ms. James, a question to one of your competitors. Sure. It's to um, uh, Zephyr Teachout. Um, so one of the worst things about being an elected official is, um, in my experience, I've attended too many funerals of individuals who've died at the hands of gun violence. And I've taken on the NRA. Um, and, um, Please and ask your question. My question to you is, why did you change your position with regards to the SAFE Act when you ran for Congress? Um, after reading some reports, it's my understanding uh, that you opposed it. You said that it was done in the middle of the night and you, um, you uh, uh, disagreed with it. And now, and as of running for Attorney General, you've cha you switched your position. What is your position today? Um, the Safe Act on Control bill passed by Governor Cuomo in the legislature right. yeah. uh, after the Sandy Hook massacre. Yeah, no, and, I, and I've been a consistent uh, supporter. I support um, background checks. I support a closing the gun show, loop, uh, show loophole. I support all, assault weapons ban. 
And I've been consistent about my criticisms of legislation that has passed without a chance for public hearing. When I was the national director of the Sunlight Foundation, one of the things we were pushing for, uh, the key piece of legislation we were working with then Senator um, Obama's office on making sure that legislation had the chance to be heard before it was passed. Um, was that, that your only criticism of the SAFE Act? That was my criticism of the SAFE Act, and that has been my consistent criticism of the SAFE Act. Okay, your opportunity to uh, ask an opponent a question. Uh, Sean? The recent uh, filings showed that you got uh, about $150,000 from one real estate um, organization, uh, the Durst organization, through various LLC loopholes. Uh, what I want to know is in the conversations that you had with the Durst organization, not what you said, but what they were saying to you about what they were looking for in an attorney general. Right. They said, I'm the most qualified with the most experience. And I, and I was there when you supported uh, you know, all, all the money you took uh, during your congressional race. Millions of dollars in super PAC funds helped your race. And in fact, you took LLC contributions, in-kind contributions in your governor's race. And right now in this race effort, you're taking tens of thousands of dollars in, in, uh, in, in donations from people in the financial services industry. And by the way, I was also there when you did oppose the SAFE Act, the most important gun safety legislation in the history of this state. Yes, you did. Folks, Google Rockefeller Republican and Zephyr Teachout because that's what you called yourself. And you should be honest gonna, with people gonna if you're going to say that. Uh, you, you quickly you know, turned the tables there. Mm -hmm. Sure. Is that that your full answer? Is that the Durst organization simply yeah. said? Listen, listen. It's a small part of my overall fundraising. We 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 got tremendous uh, support from lots of different people, and and all of the people on this stage have have donors who are supporting them. Zephyr herself has taken tens of thousands of dollars from people in the financial services industry. I'm not questioning her motives. That's a political trick. I think we should be less negative on other Democrats and talk about our ideas for the office. Okay, come back to you for. 30 seconds? Yeah, two things. One is the record, you can check the record, and it is totally clear that um, my objections had to do with the process. That is totally clear. Uh, second, I think it's really important not to take corporate money. Um, that uh, not taking LLC money actually is important, and especially for an attorney general who's going to be overseeing um, investigations into big corporations. Lastly, on the Rockefeller Republican uh, comment, do you want to address that? Oh, yeah. No, I was talking about my uh, grandparents and, and the family that I grew up with, and those are my grandparents. Well, I, I think if you Google it, you'll find she was justifying okay. folding we're, we're, to the NRA. We're going to leave it there, but it is your well, opportunity to ask a, well, ask right. a question. I think, I think you ought to level about what you told the Daily News, which is that that's why you oppose the gun safety legislation. And you, it, and this you is, your, is this your question? Yeah. You, okay. Well, no, actually, I, I, I'd like to ask a different question, okay, if I ahead. may which is that in a, mo a moment ago we were asked about our professional credentials and all of us are members of the bar. Zephyr has never become a member of the New York bar, has never taken the New York bar, isn't licensed to practice law in New York, which is sort of breathtaking when you think about becoming the chief legal officer of the state. But even more troubling, I learned recently that, that you were cited for professional misconduct by the North Carolina bar and I think, you should, I think you should explain to people why you were cited for professional misconduct in North Carolina. And I believe it was in Go the ahead. death penalty case, was it not? Go ahead, yeah. Ms. Teacher. So, so first of all, I've been a lawyer for 17 years. Um, I have been teaching law in New York for uh, 10 years. And in fact, I did take the New York bar in 1999. Um, I started practicing in North Carolina, which is where I've had my bar, um, uh, by, bar license. And um, there I was uh, cited for not uh, sharing a change of address. I was very upfront about it, and uh, it was all cleared up. Okay. Moving on. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit more about uh, reform in state government. You have an opportunity as attorney general to push legislation and, of course, a major uh, bully pulpit. And um, we're going to come back and start this round with Mr. Maloney. What are some things that you would push for changes in Albany that aren't really the powers of the Attorney General that haven't been mentioned yet? What are some things that you really think are fundamentally broken in New York that you'd like to see changed? Well, our criminal justice system needs to be completely reformed. In Congress, I've passed, uh, I've worked on legislation that would uh, make real the guarantee of effective assistance of counsel. I've spent a lot of time on prison education programs. I delivered the commencement address. Uh, inside a prison here in New York State. I don't know if a member of Congress has ever done that. I think the Attorney General could absolutely help direct uh, seized funds to pris prison education programs, which work, work miracles in terms of lowering the recidivism rate. 
I think there's so much we can do on law enforcement assisted diversion to get chronic drug addicts, particularly in the opioid and heroin epidemic, uh, directly into treatment and out of the criminal justice system. Those are some of the areas where the Attorney General could really lead in the area of criminal justice reform. Okay. Ms. Eve. Criminal justice reform would be at the top of the list. Uh, I'm 54 years of age, and in 1971, my father uh, was the very first person, non-civilian, to enter the Attica prison during the Attica prison riots. I didn't know it at the time, but I later realized that my father entered that prison not knowing whether he would come out. So ending mass incarceration, criminal justice reform, it's not just a talking point. It has been my family's work and it's been my life work going back to when I represented hundreds of women incarcerated in District of Columbia prisons. I support the legalization of marijuana. I support the expungement of any person, particularly our young people who have convictions uh, for recreational use of marijuana. Uh, I there is no more important issue than reforming our criminal justice system, but we also need to make it easier to vote. We are, we have we have led the suffrage movement. We have led the LGBTQ movement. We have led so many civil rights movements, and yet we have some of the worst voting laws in the nation. I am proud that when I was counsel to Hillary, I worked with voting rights and civil rights organizations across the country to craft legislation that had election day registration, felon reenfranchisement, no excuse absentee balloting. <laughs> the New York Times editorialized it as a gold standard for election reform. New York should be not following, we should be leading the way in helping New Yorkers exercise this most fundamental. Right. Thank you, Ms. James. Five areas. Labor. We need to protect the rights of labor, um, uh, organized labor in this state of New York. At a time when they're under attack as a result of the Janus decision, it's really critically important that we support labor. And I'm so glad that the vast majority of the labor organizations in the state have endorsed my candidacy. Two, criminal justice reform, as was mentioned. Uh, uh, poverty should not be a crime and or mental illness. And it's really critically important that we reform our criminal justice system. As someone who went to court to seek the grand jury minutes in the aftermath of the death of Eric Garner, it's really critically important um, that we transform our criminal justice system. And I'm so glad that the governor of the state of New York is has signed the bill with respect to prosecutorial misconduct. Uh, corruption, as was mentioned, we need to close the LLC loophole, public financing of campaigns. Um, uh, uh, we need to uh, uh, ban outside income. Uh, and we need term limits. Um, and then we also obviously uh, need to focus on tenants. Um, as someone who has turbocharged their worst landlord list tonight in New York City, 70,000 individuals uh, who unfortunately are homeless, we need to strengthen our tenants' laws, um, tenant protections in the state of New York, because too many of them unfortunately being harassed and abused uh, by powerful uh, landlord interest. I'm glad you mentioned that. We haven't gotten to that yet, but uh, maybe in closing statements, other people will, will be interested because, of course, the Attorney General does uh, help lead. The, the tenant protection unit. Just quickly on criminal justice reform, yeah. uh, do you support repeal of the 50A uh, yes. aspect of the civil rights law yes, that, that shields uh, police records? Okay. Without a doubt, I support it. It is part of my platform. Okay, Ms. T. Uh, as do I, and I think it's critical that um, New York lead in transparency with police violence. Right now in Las Vegas, if there is a police shooting, you know the name of the police officers within two days and full unredacted video within 72 hours. It is embarrassing that New York is so far behind. Okay, three key priorities uh, for legislative leadership. Um, the first is leading the fight against mass incarceration. We've talked a little bit about this, about cash bail, discovery reform, re-entry, expunging records, second chance sentencing, parole reform, but also changing the culture. Second, voting rights. I am a voting rights expert. And we in New York are at the back of the pack when we should be at the front of the pack. Have the best voting laws and the strongest voting rights in the country. And third, corruption and campaign finance reform. So that means really being a leader on publicly financed elections, being a leader on changing the three men in a room culture in Albany, um, being a leader on closing the LLC loophole and on investigations. Okay, I have one final question, 30 seconds each, and then we'll go to closing statements. This is obviously a Democratic primary. There's a lot of division in, in the Democratic Party right now, a lot of fighting over who's a true Democrat. There's obviously the gubernatorial primary that's being waged, lieutenant governor primary, and this primary. And there's no, no incumbent here, obviously, so it's a little bit different. But in 30 seconds, where do you fit into this discussion about who's a real Democrat, what it means to be a progressive or a centrist? Uh, how do you describe who you are to, to your fellow Democrats who you're, you're seeking votes from right now? Uh, we'll start with you, Miss Eve. I'm a progressive. 
I have been a fighter and a champion for social justice for my entire legal career ever since I graduated from Harvard Law School 28 years ago. But I will also say, you know, the name calling, that doesn't help our party. We got, we got to come together. I mean, we're all on this stage seeking to be the next people's lawyer, but we're each committed to supporting whomever wins the primary uh, if we ourselves aren't uh, the victor. And I think we need to do much more of that. If we do that, Albany will become ha have a Democratic Senate. The House will become blue, and we'll be able to advance Democratic values for all New Yorkers and all Americans. Thank you. Ms. James. I am a progressive, but you're, you're right. I don't know what it means these days. The reality is that individuals are calling themselves progressive uh, and individuals who unfortunately are ignoring 20 years of public service and abandoning the fact that we are in the midst of making history in the state of New York. It's really critically important that we have someone who has been uncompromised and someone who has been unbossed and unbought for over 20 years and someone who has spoken truth to power and someone who has stood up for marginalized individuals and individuals who are, shatting and sh who are hiding in the darkness at this point in time. It's really critically important that we have someone who is fearless and someone who will continue to use her bully pulpit, her passion, and her power to get things done, as Thank I have you. done um, in the office of Attorney General and as the public advocate currently. Okay, well, we got a preview of your closing statement, I think, but we'll get more from you. <laughs> Ms. Teachout, the Democratic uh, Party infighting, where do you stand? Well, well I got to be clear, there's, there's one area where in New York there are really, really clear lines, and this is about the IDC, the Independent Democratic Conference, um, which are Democrats who ran as Democrats and then voted for Republican leadership in Albany. Um, I, I've been fighting against the IDC for a long time, and I'm the only candidate up here to support every single Democratic challenger to the IDC. And, and the reason this is so important is that these aren't people, they're, they're running as progressive Democrats, but actually then giving their vote to, you know, essentially Paul Ryan. Um, and I, I think it's really important that all Democrats stand up with the IDC challengers so this year. That's your litmus test. Okay, Mr. Maloney? <laughs> well, look, I'm, a, I'm the first openly gay member of Congress from New York. I have an, I have an interracial family. My children are African-American, Latino. Uh, I, I won a seat in Congress in a district that voted for Donald Trump. So that is being a progressive where it counts and winning a tough fight against Republicans, not once or twice three times in a row, and I outperformed Hillary Clinton by 14 points in 2016, but I believe in a Bobby Kennedy Democratic Party. I believe in a party that is inspiring young people, has some new ideas, some new leadership, isn't afraid to try something new, but I also believe in a party that can go into the, go into, uh, into the city and give hope to people who need it. I believe in a party that has to, like I do, go onto the farm, go into agricultural areas, go into Appalachia, talk to people who have been deserting our party and talk about new ideas and new hope. And we don't have a Democrat to waste. So all this infighting and, and all this negativity from one Democrat to the other, I think it weakens us. The real fight is Donald Trump, and that's what I'm going to focus Thank on. Thank you. Thank you. So we're moving to closing statements. We're going to start with uh, Ms. Teachout and go to Mr. Maloney, Ms. Eve, and Ms. James to close us out. Uh, so you have about a uh, minute and a half to two minutes. Uh, give us your closing statement, please, Ms. Teachout. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for being a great moderator. Thank you to uh, my opponents. Um, uh, and thank you to those of you who are listening. Um, this job is so important. Uh, we've talked about some issues tonight, but we haven't really talked about the legal strategies that we need to bring to bear against Donald Trump. And the New York Attorney General has a unique capacity to really respond to this threat for a few reasons. Um, first, because Donald Trump's businesses are here in New York. And ever since he was elected, I have been leading the legal strategy to investigate illegality in Donald Trump's businesses. As I mentioned earlier, I was one of the lawyers on a lawsuit filed three days after Trump took office in the Southern District of New York, demanding that he divest his business interests. That legal strategy is ongoing. I've been working with the attorneys general in Maryland and DC, and they just had a major victory where the judge, the federal judge in that case, explicitly adopted my theory of the emoluments clause. I have been out front on the ways in which we can use anti-corruption laws to restrain this truly lawless um, administration. And I take this threat very seriously. This is about the future of the rule of law. And when the federal government is run by somebody like Donald Trump, uh, 
is overridden with fossil fuel lobbyists and big corporate lobbyists in the Republican Party. <laughs> that we can no longer trust the federal government to protect our rights in New York. It is so important to have an attorney general who doesn't take corporate money, who is independent, who is ready to bring creative legal thinking to evolving and complex theories that we haven't actually had to push before. State courts have never been more important than uh, right now in the last 30 years. And I am ready to lead that fight. Thank you so much for, for listening, and I, I hope I earn your vote. Thank you, Mr. Maloney. Well, thanks, Ben, for a great debate. Uh, thank you uh, to all of you. Look, folks, right now, uh, Donald Trump and the Republicans in Washington are on the verge of taking over the Supreme Court, and, uh, and that means everything from Roe v. Wade to our environment is on, on the line. Uh, more than ever, we need an experienced attorney with real management experience and real legal experience to lead this office, to get in that fight. I'm the one with the most experience in the fight, not talking about it, not writing about it, in the fight every day against Donald Trump, and before that, the Tea Party beaten Republicans at the ballot box, on the floor of the House of Representatives, and in the courts. If you give me an opportunity to run this office, I will be your voice and I will be your champion. And we will stand up to whoever is coming after your rights or your family. My rights and my family are on the line, too. This is a, this is a fight we have to win. Please give me your vote on September 13th, and I'll stand up to Donald Trump, I'll stand up to the crooks in Albany, and I'll be the people's lawyer. Thank you. Ms. Eve. I'm running as the most qualified, most prepared, most experienced person to be the next attorney general we must have. We are in a crisis right now. More than ever, New Yorkers need an attorney general to protect, defend, and empower them. And I am that woman. I'm the daughter of two great public servants. You know, my father created the EOP and HEOP program through which more than 100,000 New Yorkers, mostly black and brown young men and women, have gone on to college. My mother was a teacher for 33 years in New York and founded what became the largest and most comprehensive alternatives to incarceration in the state of New York. I know what good public servants look like, and I stand on my parents' shoulder, best prepared, to take on Donald Trump, having served in the trenches with Joe Biden, with Hillary Clinton, advancing civil rights, advancing women's rights, advancing environmental rights. And I stand before you the best prepared person to deal with the challenges that we in New York State own. We own the need to improve our criminal justice system, to protect Roe v. Wade, to advance voting reform, and to make sure that all children across our state have the kind of educational opportunity that I had that enabled me to stand before you as the most prepared and the most qualified and experienced candidate ready to be the people's lawyer of our great state. Thank you. And Ms. James. Thank you for allowing for this debate and for allowing us to be on the stage. My faith in the Constitution is complete. It's whole. And right now, the Constitution is being subverted. These are not my words. Those are the words of Barbara Jordan when she was investigating Richard Nixon. And we find ourselves at that point again in, in the history of this country. So it's really critically important that we all understand that no matter who you love, no matter the color of your skin, no matter your gender or where you live, that all of our rights right now, all of our values, all that we believe in as, as, as Americans is at risk. And there's just too much at risk at this point in time. And so we've got to fight back against this individual who believes that he's above the law and that the rule of law doesn't apply to him. But we also need to understand that it's really critically important that we should be more than a one-trick pony, that we should focus on all of the issues across the state of New York, from environmental laws to equal protection, to tenants' rights, to discrimination, to rights affect, to issues affecting farmers upstate, and to immigrants. As someone who has litigated and protected immigrants, as someone who has represented a family, a mother whose child was taken from her and this child right now has been reunited and they have been released from detention, as someone who represented a DACA child because she believes in dreamers, as someone who's been to Puerto Rico she, because she believes that Puerto Rico needs our help, and as someone who recognizes the power of Israel and recognizes that all of us need a fighter and someone who has a, a, a history and a record of getting things done, 20 years of public service and 20 years of independent, who stands before you in the spirit of Shirley Chisholm. And that's why, as someone who is a proud graduate of Howard University, who transformed this nation and who legalized, who challenged legal seg segregation in this country, what we need now is someone in that spirit, because this is the moment in time when we need a fighter, and that fighter is Letitia James. 
I look forward to getting your support on September 13th. Thank you, and thank you all for being here and for a great debate. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Please remember to vote. The Democratic primary election will be held Thursday, September 13th, and the general election will be Tuesday, November 6th. For more information on voting, locating your poll site, and all the candidates and races, you can visit the RaceRepresent.com website or us at GothamGazette.com or the League of Women Voters of New York, LWVNY.org. Thank you for watching Race to Represent on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Goodbye.